Hi, and welcome to my one month review of the Apple Watch Ultra. In today's video, I want to do a full review. I want to go into a lot of detail about the Apple Watch Ultra, tell you what you can expect from the battery life, tell you what features it has, and tell you how it held up in the past month for me as a phone replacement. And I also want to tell you why I think that the Apple Watch Ultra, for most people, is the ultimate mobile phone. So let's dive right into it. Before we can talk about the Apple Watch Ultra, I quickly want to talk about the devices here in front of me to give you some context. Let's start with this one. It's a pretty old Nokia communicator. Let's pretend for the moment that it's just this front side because this is the oldest phone I found and, well, for the purpose of this video, let's just assume that that's all there is to it. When mobile phones first were a thing, what could they do? Well, they started literally just being phones. You could take calls on them. And eventually you could also start to do text messaging on it. So you could send SMS on these things, but that was about it. And yeah, this is basically what these clunky old things could do. The battery life was actually not that good in the early days. And these first sort of mobile phones, yeah, they, they got you through some calling, but not that much, to be honest. Ironically, this one can open up and do some office related stuff, but we're just gonna forget about this for now. Then eventually we got feature phones like this one. They are essentially the same thing. You can text on them, write SMS, take phone calls, and that's their primary function. But they also have some other functionalities. Like for example, they have a very spec down web browser on them. They're connected to the internet and you can surf on some, what they called WAP websites. So basically very minimal versions of some other websites. They also had some very basic um, online text messaging. So for example, on these Nokia phones, it was actually possible to install WhatsApp back in the day. But yeah, that's about it. Like they didn't have the app store or something like you know it from today. And there are not hundreds of thousands of apps, but more or less they come with what they can do. And you can do some internet connected things, but not that much. I would still count these as mobile phones actually. And then eventually we got these things, smartphones. And the sort of standout feature of them is that you can install software after the fact from something like an app store, right? And then you can go ahead and you can basically make these things do anything and everything you want. They have full-fledged web browsers on them and you can basically browse to any website you like and they have really good cameras on the back. Some of them, like for example the later and bigger phones, have pretty good batteries that sometimes last for days. And so these things sort of have become our one and done tool for essentially everything. But they have some downsides in my opinion. For example, with these smartphones, since they can do everything and anything, you get distracted quite easily. You get dragged into these social media infinity pools and you lose a lot of time being distracted in your smartphone. On top of that, these smartphones are still physical objects that you need to take with you. And I mean, yeah, as important as these things have become in our life, it's pretty hard to forget them. But for me personally, everything that I need to carry needs to take space, for example, in my jeans pockets or something like that. And I get a little bit annoyed if I need to remember to carry around stuff. So for me, there are some downsides to this. Most importantly, the whole distraction topic and the efficiency topic, but also the whole, I have to think about it and I have to take it and it's in the way sometimes topic. So this is where we're coming from. This is sort of the history of, of phones, right? But then Apple released this, the original Apple Watch. And back in the day, it came out almost entirely as an accessory to your phone. So it couldn't really be used as a standalone device. Instead, you would pair it with an iPhone that you always had to have with you. And then you could do some of the things that your iPhone could do on the watch, essentially. You could take some calls, you could use some apps. Back in the day, there was actually an Instagram app for it. And yeah, I mean, you can basically have all the functionality that a traditional mobile phone has, except that it's tethered to your phone, so you can't really go anywhere. And then with the Apple Watch Series 3, I believe, Apple actually gave us this little red ring on the digital crown of the Apple Watch which basically means that now it can be connected to a cellular network. And for the first time ever, you can basically take your Apple Watch disconnected from the iPhone and still have a useful device with you. And this is the point where I've been thinking, you know, can you use this as a replacement for your phone? It can take phone calls. It can receive SMS with some caveats. You can do most things that you need to do to stay connected, like reply to emails, reply to Slack messages even. And you can do all of this without having to think about your phone. And since the screen is so much smaller, it's also way less distracting, right? So I bought an Apple Watch Series 4 with cellular. I connected it and in the beginning it was pretty great. Honestly, it lasted pretty much exactly for a day. It would be dead by the end of the day, but you could get through one day. And 
for my schedule, it was good enough. I could go to places without the phone, I could work out without my phone, and the Apple Watch would last almost entirely the day, sometimes not quite, but on average, I would say it was okay. To summarize, here are a couple of points on why I think it's worthwhile to use an Apple Watch as your phone replacement, in general. First of all, ultimate portability. When I use a smartphone, I have to think about taking it, it takes up space in my pockets, with the Apple Watch, all of that is gone. The Apple Watch is there from the moment you put it on your wrist and there's no way to forget it because it's always with you. It's also always there when you need it because you just turn your wrist and, well, everything is right there in reach and it takes up zero space in your pockets. The second point is that it allows me to always stay connected wherever I go. I'm always available for phone calls, I'm always available via text message, I receive all my notifications that I want to receive on the go, but I get that without the constant distraction that I would get from my phone. And because the screen is comparatively small and scrolling on apps is quite uncomfortable, to be honest, although not impossible, it means that I can do the things that I need to do on this Apple Watch. But if I don't want to do something and it's just distracting and, you know, it would be this pull your smartphone out of the pocket and scroll for half an hour reflex, it keeps you connected, but it comes without the downsides of drawing in your attention all the time. And then the point that I was hinting at before, it sometimes seems a little bit uncomfortable on this small screen to do some things. And on the one hand, that's an upside because it means that your attention is not drawn into the watch so much. But on the other hand, still almost everything is possible. There are some things that aren't possible. For example, using WhatsApp. And I'll get into the details on that a little bit later on the limitations of the watch. But for the most part, you can access websites, you can access email, you can type on it, you can dictate to it. And I mean, everything you really need to do on the go, the Apple Watch can do. So for me, it's the ideal compromise. But then over time, the battery life got worse. The battery life got so bad with the degradation of the battery that by the end of its lifetime, after I think three years, I definitely couldn't go without a smartphone anymore. The battery would die after three or four hours on cellular and was definitely not up to speed anymore when it came to using it as a phone replacement. And at that time, I decided to upgrade to the Apple Watch Series 7 and give it a new fresh shot. The reason for this, and you can watch my Apple Watch Series 7 one month review, is that it got a fast charging capable charger, which means that just putting it on the charger for a few minutes would get you so much battery life that I could make it work as a smartphone replacement again. I could put it on the charger quickly in the morning while I was showering, and I could put it on the charger again quickly in the evening before I went to bed. And yeah, it held up for a day. I used this Apple Watch Series 7 for the past year before I switched to the Apple Watch Ultra, and I used it completely as a phone replacement, and it worked. I have to say though, it was not very comfortable because it still would last pretty much exactly a day. You could make it work more consistently than with the Series 4 or previous Apple Watches, but still, it was a tight fit. By the way, I'm planning to do a one year later review of the Series 7, because these findings will also apply to the Apple Watch Series 8. And with all of that being said, this is where the Apple Watch Ultra comes in. I bought the Apple Watch Ultra because Apple promised significantly better battery life. Personally, I don't care too much about the design, I don't care too much about the titanium case and everything. Honestly, those things are cool, but not the seller for me. I almost exclusively care about the battery life. But I do care about that so much that it was fine for me to spend 1000 euros on this watch to use it as my phone replacement. And in this video today, I will tell you everything you need to know about how this thing performs as a phone replacement. I want to review the Apple Watch Ultra in three steps. The first one will be on the actual hardware, so the casing, the dimensions, the design, and also the strap, which this is not. I will show you the Alpine loop that I have in a moment. And then we can talk about how it basically fits on your wrist, how it feels along the day and stuff like that. The second part will be on battery life. I did a quite extensive analysis on the battery life and I don't think you will be disappointed waiting for that. And then finally, the third part will be sort of everyday practicality as a phone replacement. What can you do? What can't you do? And should you do it? So let's get started with the hardware of the device. Now the Apple Watch Ultra is the biggest Apple Watch that Apple ever made. It's quite significantly bigger than the Series 7, to be honest, and you do feel that on your wrist. I wore the Apple Watch Ultra for, I think, about two weeks after I got it, exclusively, and then just out of curiosity switched back to the Apple Watch Series 7 for a couple of days. And the Series 7 does feel quite a lot lighter and smaller once you go back to it. I don't want to say it's a liberating feeling going to the Series 7, but it does feel... I mean, to some degree, it just feels a little bit lighter and a little bit less present on your wrist. 
Not that this is uncomfortable. The Apple Watch Ultra is definitely something that you can wear every day and sort of the whole day, right? It's not uncomfortable. When it comes to the actual case, the watch comes in this titanium color, in this raw titanium. And this is actually the only color that it comes in. So with previous Apple Watches, you could choose between a couple of colors. That's no longer the case with Apple Watch Ultra. It also comes with a flat sapphire crystal screen. And if you look very closely, you can see that the casing has a slight lip over the screen. So that means that if you put it on the screen, the screen won't scratch. That was a big problem with the Series 7 and earlier. And my Series 4 actually got scratched up quite good when I put it face down on the floor once accidentally. Having said that, I actually bumped this thing into quite a lot of things the past few days, like doors and stuff, because I mean, I am, I'm trying to be gentle with my watches, but you know how it is. You can't be that careful that you never bump into anything. And it actually didn't take anything away. Like I could look for hours and I wouldn't find a single scratch, dent or anything. And there have been other videos actually, I'm gonna try to link one, of someone who actually really tried to destroy it and it held up incredibly well. So when it comes to durability, it seems like the Apple Watch Ultra is the real deal and it's probably not gonna break on you. One final thing I wanna mention about the Apple Watch Ultra is this orange action button. To be honest, I haven't found too much use for it yet. The one cool thing that you can do is that you can map essentially anything to it by creating a shortcut that runs on the Apple Watch and you click the button and it executes the shortcut. I still personally have it on workout mode, so I can start a workout with the button. I do like it for that, but I don't think it's as much of a game changer as other people said it is. I can imagine that for extreme sports or sports in general, it might be very, very useful. For everyday use, it's nice to have, it's not a big game changer. With the hardware of the actual case out of the way, let's quickly talk about the band I got. This is the Alpine Loop in color Starlight. I said it before in the first impressions video and I'm gonna probably keep repeating it until I find a better band, but this is by far the best Apple Watch band I ever wore. It's incredibly comfortable, fits perfectly. It hasn't gotten any stain so far, despite me cooking with a bunch of oil and stuff, getting it stained, but then they washed out as if nothing ever happened. The quality is amazing. The only thing that's important is that you buy it in the right size. I originally got it in size S. I could get it over my wrist, but it was quite difficult. Now I have it in size M. Apple exchanged it within three minutes in an Apple store. It was literally the easiest thing ever. And now it fits perfectly. So when it comes to the Alpine Loop and Starlight, I absolutely love it. Let's quickly look at it on the watch. The actual mechanism of attaching the Apple Watch bands to the watch has actually not changed at all. You just slide it in. It's incredibly quick, just like this. Then you put the watch on your wrist and with the Alpine Loop, you just sort of pull on this side until it feels snug and then thread the little hook in the corresponding loop on the actual band. Now this mechanism is really cool, I think, because it's really easy to put in, but it's not very easy to open. You kind of have to twist it out. And I mean, you can do it in a fluid motion, but it's a lot harder. And it also gives me a lot of confidence that this band stays on. Like I wouldn't mind going like climbing with this or something, or like going, I don't know, on hikes in like more rough terrain. I'm pretty sure that this band would essentially stay on always, and I can't imagine how it could come off by accident. I also want to quickly talk about band compatibility with the Apple Watch Ultra. It is ever so slightly wider than the watches before it. So you can fit all the 44 and 42 millimeter watch bands, so the old one, on this watch, and it will look just fine. There's a very tiny gap on the side. You can see it and you can feel it, but if you wear the watch normally, it doesn't distract me at all, actually. And the black Nike band actually goes perfectly with the Apple Watch Ultra, in my opinion. The same actually stands true the other way around. So if you take the Alpine Loop, for example, and you install it on an Apple Watch Series 7, for example, the band has a very, very slight overhang on the side of the watch. And again, you can feel it and you can see it if you look closely, but it doesn't bother me. I used the Series 7 with the Alpine Loop and I really liked it. It was a great band also on this watch. I'm not a material scientist. I've heard before that some metals and their interaction can cause problems. I don't know if that's the case with titanium and aluminum, for example. But just when it comes to fit and looks, I can recommend even the Apple Watch Ultra bands with older Apple Watches. So have a go, see if they fit you. These are all the things I wanted to tell you about the Apple Watch Ultra's hardware. And with that, let's go into the battery test. For me personally, the battery life is by far the most interesting feature about this Apple Watch, because it allows me to use the Apple Watch Ultra comfortably as a phone replacement. Because that's the case and because I find it this important, I wanted to make sure to give you a thorough and precise analysis of the battery life. So let's go into my testing methodology. First of all, the settings on my Apple Watch. 
I had the always on display enabled the entire time, the screen brightness set to maximum, the automatic workout detection enabled, Siri voice activation activated, and finally I had the wake duration set to 70 seconds. This means that anytime I touch the watch, it stays on for 70 seconds unless I twist my wrist or cover the screen with my hand. There are some limitations to the testing methodology that I'm going to explain to you in a second. First of all, I only have one single Apple Watch Ultra. This means that, well, this Apple Watch Ultra performs exactly like this, but yours might perform slightly differently. It would need a far bigger amount of watches to confidently give um, a statement about the battery life. But at least this will give you some direction of what at least my Apple Watch Ultra can do. Then I only tested it for a limited amount of time. It's been two to three weeks that I actually tested this, and then the rest of the time went into the production of this video. So two to three weeks of testing is quite a lot, I think, but it's not enough, again, to have a like perfectly full picture here. And finally, I also didn't test the Apple Watch Ultra in a controlled environment. What this means is that, for example, the signal strength of cell towers I can control. And so therefore, there will be quite a lot of variance between the tests that I did. Now, having said that, this is not a scientific paper, it's just supposed to give you a sort of good guess of what the um, battery life on the Apple Watch Ultra can be like, and please take it for what it is. What I did to actually determine the battery life is I took a screenshot before and after each activity, showing both the battery percentage and the time. And then I put it into this gigantic spreadsheet, which basically calculates the time until the watch dies from 0 to 100% based on each of these data points. And then, based on all of this information, I did some basic statistics that I will show you now to show you what the Apple Watch Ultra can really do. Let's dive right into it. First of all, let's start with the charging speed. And before I go into the actual content of this graph, I quickly want to explain what this graph means. For each of these categories, I basically have four bars. The first bar is called the weighted average. I conducted multiple test runs with the same activity. And each of these test runs had, had a different duration. So that means if one test run only was five minutes and the other one was 30 minutes, then the result of a 30 minute one should probably weigh more in this average. And this is what this weighted average does. It basically equalizes the weight perfectly between all of the measurements I did. So then in the end we have a proper representative average. The second column here is called the standard deviation. This is a statistical parameter that tells you how spread out the values were. Let's say I tried a specific activity five times and the lowest and the highest amount of battery life I got were vastly different, then the standard deviation would be quite high. If all of them were very similar, it would be low, which means that this is a good indicator of confidence. Basically, the lower the standard deviation is, the more confident we can be that we actually get close to the weighted average. And then column three and four show you the minimum and the maximum runtime that I got. So the worst case and the best case. Finally, here on the bottom, you can see a number called N. This is the sample size. Or in other words, the amount of minutes that I performed this activity to obtain all these numbers. With that said, let's get into the individual results. I tested the charging with both of the charger options for the Apple Watch Ultra. The first one being the low wattage charger that you got from the Series 6 and earlier, and the second one being the high wattage charger which you got from Series 7 onwards. Let's look at the low wattage charger first. You can see that it took roughly four hours for the watch to charge from 0 to 100%. The standard deviation here is quite low, which means that it will almost always take around four hours to do this. Generally, when it comes to charging, you can see that there is still a difference between the minimum and the maximum. This is because it takes less time to charge the battery from a lower percentage than from a higher percentage for the same amount of charge. So basically, for example, going from 15 to 30 percent takes less time than going, let's say, from 75 percent to 90 percent. With that being said, let's look at the high wattage charger. Here you can see that we were able to charge the watch in about 1.3 hours, from 0 to 100%. Again, this result was quite consistent, although here there was an even bigger difference between the minimum and maximum. So for example, charging from 90 to 100 will take a lot longer than from 20 to 30%. Let's look at the activities that actually draw power. I sorted them from the ones that you can do the least amount of time towards the one that you can do the most amount of time. You can see that the first one here is doing a FaceTime audio call on cellular. This means that I had my AirPods Pro in, I had the Apple Watch on cellular data and was doing FaceTime calls. You can see that I can perform this activity for roughly three and a half hours before the watch dies from 100%. You can also see that the standard deviation is quite low, so this will be relatively accurate. The reason why this is so low is because 
The Apple Watch here needs to con constantly download and upload data during using the cellular network. It needs to upload your voice to your partner and needs to download your partner's voice to you so that you can have the call. The next activity is music streaming. This was quite an interesting one. I was able to stream music on average for five and a half hours, but I have to say that here the standard deviation is relatively high. The reason for this is likely that the Apple Watch is caching some of the songs that I listened to before without actually downloading them. So while I tried my best to only listen to songs that were not downloaded to the watch, I suspect that if I listen to a song more than once, the second time it's not going to be downloaded again, which then leads to this difference between the minimum and the maximum amount that I can get on music streaming. This is also suspicious because if we look at outdoor workouts plus music streaming, I get a way higher number of around 8 hours. Now I suspect that I did the outdoor workouts after the music streaming tests, so that the music was already cached somehow or maybe downloaded to some degree. I can't quite explain it, but definitely there was something weird here about the music streaming. Again, take this with a grain of salt. There's something weird here. Then the next one is driving with the Apple Watch on cellular. And here I was able to get around 15 hours. So this means that the Apple Watch was on cellular and just idling. I didn't really do anything with it. The reason that this is quite low comparatively to the other idle numbers that we see is that the Apple Watch needs to jump a lot between cell towers while you're moving. You can also see that the standard deviation is comparatively high here again. I suspect that this is because of signal strength. Sometimes the Apple Watch will have a little bit of a better signal on a certain route than on another route and then you get better battery life or worse battery life respectively. Going to the next category, I did one day at a water park with my girlfriend. Now here you can see I don't have a standard deviation, this is because I could only take one sample of this and I was able to keep the watch running for 20 hours. So this is actually quite a lot of time and this means that the watch was on cellular and um, basically idling with the underwater mode activated. And yeah, 20 hours, I think this will get you through a day. The next activity I call just the walk. It basically means I was outside, I walked somewhere and the Apple Watch was in cellular, I didn't do any tracking or something, I wasn't listening to music. Now I got almost the same amount of time here as when I was at the water park, which means that submerging the Apple Watch doesn't actually cause you any decrease in battery life. The next activity is an outdoor workout. Here the Apple Watch is on cellular data, I'm not listening to music or anything, but it's still doing the fitness tracking basically. I got around 21.5 hours in this test and you can see that I got a relatively high standard deviation with the maximum being impressively high at 1,900 minutes. Again, I suspect that this has something to do with signal strength. So when I did the workout somewhere with good signal, maybe I get a longer battery life than when I am somewhere else with a less good signal. The next activity is having the Apple Watch on idle while being on cellular data. So that means you're not walking anywhere, you're just basically sitting, for example, at a desk and the Apple Watch is on cellular data. Here, I got around 23 hours, which I think personally is quite a good result. It means that while doing this, Apple Watch Ultra will get you easily through a day with some battery to spare. For me personally, that's a great result and much better than Series 7, by the way. Again here, you can see that we have a comparatively high standard deviation. Besides the signal strength, I actually have one more suspicion on why this is a relatively high deviation here and why I sometimes get better or worse runtime while idling on cellular. I looked carefully at all the data that I had from the different test runs and I noticed that there are basically two groups. One group that has comparatively bad battery life and one that has comparatively good battery life. I think the reason is that the Apple Watch has an ambient light sensor. And if you wear it like this over your pullover, the screen is going to be on always on the entire time. However, if you cover it, I think the screen dims quite a bit or even turns off, and this for sure improves battery life. Going to the next category here, the first one we have is driving while on Bluetooth. So this means that you have your phone with you while driving. I only did one relatively short drive here, but I got 27.5 hours. So that means that if you have your phone with you while driving, you get a significantly improved battery life here, because the Apple Watch doesn't have to jump between cell towers and stuff like that, and can just keep the cellular modem off entirely. The next category I call mixed use. This is basically when I went through a normal day with the Apple Watch on Wi-Fi. So my phone wasn't there, I was somewhere where I had still had Wi-Fi connection. I used it to text a little bit, a little bit of music, stuff like that, a little bit of email. And here I got 34 hours of idling and mixed use, which I think is quite good. Again, I only tested this once, but for 226 minutes, so it should average out quite well. The next category is mixed use on Bluetooth, which is the same thing as before, but this time my iPhone is nearby. And you can see that here I get 44.5 hours. So now we're getting into two-day territory, easily actually. 
which is quite nice. You can also see that the standard deviation is now comparatively low, so you'll get those two days pretty much for sure when you have your phone nearby. Then we have idling on Wi-Fi, which means no activity and I'm still connected to a Wi-Fi network. And you can see that here we're by now at 52.5 hours, which easily is two days for sure. So that means that if you don't use your watch a lot, but you still have a Wi-Fi connection, you can confidently go with the Apple Watch for two days. The next category is idling on Bluetooth. So that means you're not using the watch, but your phone is nearby. And here we're now getting into the realm of three days. So if you don't use the watch a lot, but you have your phone, you really use it like as a watch and to maybe to receive notifications. It can last you three days, which I think is quite impressive and for sure way better than the Series 7 could ever do. As you can see in this run, I have a quite high standard deviation. I suspect again that this is due to signal strength. If your phone is far away and the Bluetooth connection is weak, it will use more power to keep the link active or might even switch to Wi-Fi or cellular. But you can also see here, on the maximum, I got almost five days out of it. So that means that if you're lucky and your signal is really good, your iPhone is really nearby, and maybe you have the watch under your pullover, so it dims the screen a little bit, or you even turn off the always on display, you might be able to go five days with this watch without charging it. Let's go into the last category, which is sleep tracking. You can see that when connected to Bluetooth, the Apple Watch would theoretically do up to four days of sleep tracking. Obviously, you're not going to sleep for four days, but still, the Apple Watch has quite good battery life when you're in sleep tracking, and it doesn't consume a lot of power. Surprisingly, in the one run I did where I slept with the Apple Watch on Wi-Fi, it actually ran longer than on Bluetooth, but this is within the margin of error, I would say. So yeah, let's summarize all of those results on one single chart. You can see that between doing a FaceTime audio call and doing sleep tracking on Wi-Fi, there's quite a significant difference. You might get between three and a half hours of battery life up to four days of theoretical battery life. With that said, now you can basically piece together your day and figure out if Apple Watch Ultra will last you long enough to get through a whole day. For me personally, it does, easily. It's usually a two-day watch, actually. Today, I'm on the second day, it's still at 20% and I charged it yesterday morning. So battery life can be amazing. And I know that some people haven't gotten through a day and yes, you can kill it with very heavy use with, for example, streaming a lot of music, a lot of workout tracking. Yes, for sure, you can kill it in a day. But I would say for normal use, it is a two-day watch and it's comfortably a one-day watch for almost everyone. So let's talk about using the Apple Watch as a phone replacement while driving. There are a couple of caveats that you need to keep in mind. The first one is that CarPlay is unavailable on the Apple Watch. This means that if your car relies on CarPlay, you can't use it. And if you don't have a built-in GPS, that kind of really sucks. One thing you can do with some cars is to pair it using the normal Bluetooth audio pairing. And that works fine, then you can use turn-by-turn -turn navigation and you can even use the hands-free. But with some cars that doesn't work. For example, in this car I have a Pioneer aftermarket head unit that supports wireless CarPlay and everything. It works amazing with my iPhone. However, with the Apple Watch it just won't pair. It starts the pairing and then it just errors out at some point. One of the possible solutions for me, since I usually also have an iPad with me, would be to just run CarPlay on the iPad. However, for some reason Apple doesn't allow that. I don't quite understand it because obviously the iPad has all the necessary hardware to do this. Um, yeah, but it's currently not possible. So Apple, if you're listening, it would be amazing if we could get CarPlay on the iPad. And I mean, maybe even on the Apple Watch, right? Like maps and having music on a little screen in the car can't be that difficult. And I think it would be amazing if this was possible. The other thing to consider when using the Apple Watch in the car is that um, because you're driving at a somewhat high speed, it needs to switch cell towers quite often. That leads to higher battery draw in my experience. So that means that you get less battery life than you would normally get on cellular if you use the Apple Watch while driving. So keep those points in mind and yeah, then I guess for some it's feasible to use the Apple Watch as a phone replacement also while driving. For me, for longer trips, I'm taking my iPhone because I really like CarPlay and there's currently no other way to get it. Let's talk about some of the limitations when using an Apple Watch as your phone replacement. This doesn't only apply to the Apple Watch Ultra, it applies to any Apple Watch you want to use as a phone replacement. The first and by far the biggest point is that the app selection is unfortunately quite limited. Some messaging apps work fine. For example, iMessage and Telegram, you can use, no problem. Others aren't available. For example, WhatsApp. 
I tried quite hard to find a workaround to actually initiate a conversation on WhatsApp, but I haven't found one. It seems to be impossible, from all I can tell. However, you can reply to messages using the notification reply feature. And this goes for all apps that support this. So, for example, Slack isn't available on the Apple Watch, but you can reply to messages that you get. The same goes for WhatsApp and all the other messengers that I tried. The next limitation is that watching videos on the Apple Watch Ultra doesn't seem to be currently possible. There is one app that supports it, and from what I heard, it seems to work okay. However, you need to give your credentials to a developer that's not from Google. And personally, I'm not the biggest fan of that. So I avoid using that app, and for the time being, I am not watching videos on the Apple Watch Ultra. The screen is quite small anyway, like would you really want to do that? However, unfortunately, YouTube Music also doesn't work. So if you want to listen to music that is only on YouTube, you're going to be unfortunately out of luck with the Apple Watch. Finally, the one major complication I found with using the Apple Watch Ultra or any other Apple Watch for that fact as your phone replacement is that for obvious reasons, you cannot use it to scan QR codes. Now, this is a problem because many restaurants these days only give out their menus on QR codes due to COVID related reasons. And in all these situations, you're out of luck. You're going to have to find someone with a smartphone to scan the barcode for you and to show you the menu. Other than that, I have to say anything that I can and want to do on my smartphone on the go, I can also do on the Apple Watch. And then for the more advanced things that I do, as I said before, I would use an iPad Pro because in my opinion, the iPad Pro or in fact any iPad is probably better at most of these things that you really seriously need to do than an iPhone is. And then one final thing I want to mention before closing this video is that now with WatchOS 9.1, you also get data roaming support on all cellular Apple Watches from Series 4 onwards. This brings Apple Watch one step closer to be a true phone replacement, because now once you leave the country, you can still use it. I just installed WatchOS 9.1, and as you can see, I already have the switch for data roaming. I unfortunately didn't get a chance yet to test this, but as soon as I have a chance, I will definitely test it. Also, Apple says that WatchOS 9.1 will increase the battery life of the Apple Watch Ultra in some scenarios. I will definitely be testing that, and if there's a significant change, I will mention it in the comments below this video. I didn't test any of the battery life in this video with watchOS 9.1, but with a previous release, because otherwise it probably would have never gotten out. With that, I want to close the video. Thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed it, hit the thumbs up button below. And if you want to see more videos like it, I invite you to subscribe to my channel and stick around. Thank you so much, have a great day, and I'll see you in the next one.